I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Aranya Kalia is a senior analyst in Everest Group's global sourcing practice. As part of her role, she has supported clients in areas related to their location strategy, workforce strategy, and peer benchmarking. Prashre Kala, vice president, is a member of the global sourcing team and assists clients on topics related to location optimization, enabling talent models for digital initiatives and benchmarking of global delivery models. Akshay Matter is a practice director in Everest Group's global sourcing practice. He assists clients in area of locations optimization, workforce strategy, and productivity. Rishi Raj Agarawala is a practice director in Everest Group's global sourcing team. In his role, is that he assists clients on topics related to global services delivery locations and workforce strategy. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Prashray. Thank you, Rafal, and welcome everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. For today's webinar, we've chosen a very interesting focus topic. Now, uh, as we get into client conversations these days, uh, one of the first topics which is discussed is the macroeconomic slowdown and potential impact it may have on the global service delivery strategy. It's quickly followed by questions on how should the service delivery location strategy change to meet some of the changes which are expected in the market, right? Now, with that context, in today's webinar, we'll focus on four key elements. Uh, first, how has the global service market evolved so far in the year? Second, how's the location strategy for service providers and enterprises changed in the past couple of years? Third, the potential impact of this macroeconomic slowdown on talent? And fourth, what are some of the key steps which organizations can take, especially with regards to their uh, service delivery location strategy, as they choose to find ways to mitigate potential risks and impact of the slowdown? With that, uh, we'll first start with my colleague, Rishi, uh, who will provide us with an overview of the health of the market so far. Thanks, thanks, Prashant. So if I look at H1 2022, both the service provider as well as the GBS or the global business services segment, both of them witnessed growth. Within the service provider segment, uh, we saw heavy growth across both the global service providers as well as the offshore heritage ones. And so similarly on the GBS side, we saw a significant increase in number of center setups in 2021, and the growth trend continues in 2022. Net-net, all segments of the market continue, continue with the growth momentum we saw in 2021. And if we look at the overall center setups uh, on the next slide. Yeah, so the overall center setups combined across service providers and GBS continue to grow. What both GBS and service provider center setups are increasing, the growth rate particularly in H1 2022 has been higher for service providers, resulting in an increase in share of the service provider center setups. Uh, this was primarily driven by the need to diversify into new locations, uh, we saw a lot of uh, service providers setting up in tier two, three locations, non-traditional geographies. And a primary re reason for this was to improve BCP, gain access to talent, and also in some cases penetrate to newer markets. Similarly, if we look at the geography view of it, we saw an increase in center setups in offshore nearshore locations. And this was again primarily driven by talent constraints in onshore geographies and the increasing cost pressure resulting in a growth in offshore nearshore locations. Now, if we look at an industry view of this, what we see on the top are the leading industries in terms of outsourcing deals. The government sector continues to be the leader and continues to grow, followed by the BFSI and technology and communication vertical. 
within the GBS space, the demand for new center setups was driven by technology and communication as we saw an increase in digital COE setups by these companies. This was followed by manufacturing and both te te technology and communications and manufacturing continue to witness growth. Another interesting segment that you would see here is retail and CPG, where the demand across both outsourcing and GBS center setups kind of saw a growth, primarily driven by the shift towards digital services from traditional services and the increasing e-commerce penetration. Now, if we double click on the outsourcing deals, what we see is a growth uh, is a growth in short term deals and and smaller size deals. Uh, this is again the growth in smaller size deals is primarily driven by the growth in, in increase in demand for digital deals, which is driving the demand for smaller deals. Yeah. So, uh, Rishis actually quite interesting that you pointed out that what we are seeing is growth across all type of metrics which we track from a global service delivery uh, measurement point of view right whether it's delivery center setups whether it's deals deal sizes right so we are seeing continued growth across multiple dimensions and obviously uh, what this definitely does indicate indicate that enterprises and service providers are more in a growth mode right now but uh, as we would also discuss in the next few pages, and uh, I think everybody is on the same page here, that while companies have been in the growth phase for the past few years, uh, there is no going away from the big message, which is visible there in all microeconomic metrics, that there is a global slowdown, which is coming. Now, there are many metrics which point towards this uh, slowdown. Whether we, you know, whether we see uh, high inflation rates, high prices in all geographies, uh, major nations' GDP is contracting, contracting for a couple of quarters, uh, which traditionally would have been the usual definition of a recession. When we see some of the consumer sentiment indices as well, right? Whether it's you know anxiety levels, whether we see, for example, even the uh, number of Google searches for the word recession, which tend to spike and tend to predict an actual recession, right? Uh, all of these have spiked in the last few quarters. Uh, this is very much visible in also the strategy which governments and central banks are taking throughout the world. Uh, almost all major economies and developing nations have reduced liquidity and in increased interest, ra interest ra rates throughout the world, right? So almost all macroeconomic factors pointing towards the fact that there is a slowdown coming. And while Rishi has talked about how we've seen the market show a healthy growth so far, I think this the macroeconomic picture remains quite a concern as it comes to service providers and enterprises as they look at the future forward, right? Now, some of the factors which are leading to these rising concerns, uh, for service providers, there's a very high exposure to US and Europe markets, where some of these slowdown metrics are even more severe compared to other geographies. Uh, and then there is continued margin pressure on service providers, right? However, uh, the metrics which we are tracking for the first time ever, now usually in a recession with a slowdown, we also see that unemployment rate tends to rise. Uh, there's greater number of workforce which is displaced. But in this particular scenario, for the first time ever, what we are seeing is that unemployment rates are at record lows the demand for talent is far outstripping the supply of talent. So again, quite a unique feature. Uh, this kind of an observation has not been there in any other slowdown so far. So you know, something quite new and unique, which actually leads us to believe that if there's a slowdown, the impact of it will not be as severe on the global services industry. And you know, with that, uh, you know, I'll ask my colleague Akshay, uh, Akshay, you know, usually we track many of these metrics. I know we've talked about some macroeconomic metrics, but then we track this down to outsourcing, uh, sourcing spend and various other metrics, right? And how we predict how the market is going to behave in the future. What are some of the key observations as you go through some of that data? Thank you, Prashtay. Um, and as you rightly said, I think this is a unique situation. Um, when you see the overall global services industry, uh, the past one year, 
has been amongst the best years it has ever had, both in terms of revenue growth as well as headcount growth. Again, <clears throat> drivers for this include rollout of vaccine, increased demand of digital, um, and everyone wants to run the bank. Now, when we see these similar parameters this year, our estimates suggest that this year also will be a bumper year uh, for both the industry. We expect the industry to grow at a uh, good double digit. And if and this is also visible, if you see on the next page, how some of the service provider uh, community is performed. Right? For example, for most providers right now, the bookings to bill ratio is amongst the highest as we have seen in the past couple of years. Uh, this is also visible in their own confidence in the guidance which they've given us. Most providers in the previous quarter, they have increased their guidance, which suggests that they also strongly believe that they will do better in this fiscal year, right? And the same is also visible when you talk about sell-side analysts who track these firms. Their belief also says the same, that they expect a good double-digit growth from most providers. All of this uh, led us to believe that while in the near term, the industry is going to stay resilient, there's enough demand for them to uh, tear out there to keep them occupied. Again, it will also depend on how some of the other things change, right? For example, the community, the service sector, if you see on the next page, will have to be vigilant on how this slowdown impacts uh, the other multiple stakeholders which are participants. For example, uh, if you talk about capital markets, uh, technology stocks have seen a beating and this is not only there for service sector, but across the globe, other tech stocks as well. I think, so there is this challenge which providers are uh, seeing. At the same time, when you talk about the other major uh, stakeholders in this relationship, which is essentially talent, we are seeing uh, with the intent of you know conserving cash, which often comes in an environment like this, uh, we are seeing firms holding out on variable bonuses, firms holding out on performance bonuses. We continue to see high attrition, uh, and what that means is that uh, the entire market on a whole needs to be cautious on how they approach the next two three quarters. What that leads to believe uh, us to believe is. Uh, there are three broader things, uh, if you see on the next slide, the three or broader things which uh, the industry on its own will need to focus on. The first one, as you're discussing right now, the entire wage inflation, uh, which has resulted into lower operating margin, that is a key driver or a key uh, objective for our enterprise as well as providers, right? Trying to bring this operating margin under control or optimize that. The other uh, thing which Prashta you hinted at, uh, demand being there in the market for digital, for new kind of services. Enterprises and providers would need to explore newer locations, uh, whether it is, you know, tier two, tier three locations in offshore markets like India, Philippines, or even tier two, tier three market uh, locations in near shore, onshore regions. Okay. Primarily to drive talent in the niche area. And the third thing is, uh, because there is an intent to conserve cash, everyone would need to work towards rationalizing their capital expenditure. What that means is, from a service delivery perspective, um, you're looking at, let's say, setting up smaller centers, maybe investing more, or uh, having more of your workforce working, working in remote hybrid kind of model, so that you conserve that cash. Okay. Um, Aran? Sure. In fact, um, sorry to interrupt on this. I mean, it's uh, quite different, right? And I mean, it's like heights of mixed messaging, right? We look at the macroeconomic indicators, they tend to be somewhat bleak, but now when you're talking about the services industry, a lot of these are actually positive metrics, right? Whether you're looking at, you know, Rishi earlier described about setups increasing, you described about how book to build, you know, seems to be quite high and increasing. So somewhat mixed messaging, I think economic situation somewhat different from what companies themselves are observing. So generally when you talk to clients so while this is data what we've shared so far generally in your conversations with clients what does the mood tend to be like is it more bleak future is it skepticism or is it like boldly marching forward right so where does the mood tend to lie in your conversations with clients 
I think I think in most of our conversations uh, within the community, right? I think the mood right now is not bleak. Uh, they still see that the next two quarters, three quarters, they feel that uh, the numbers which they have, the demand which they have, is quite resilient. Uh, that being said, of course, everyone is cautiously monitoring the macroeconomic conditions, right? Because what we have seen in the past as well, um, in a situation like this, when you have a slowdown, enterprises need to uh, typically cut down on discretionary spend, which tends to impact the global services, right? So net net, uh, next two, three quarters, I think the mood is pretty upbeat. Um, but everyone is cautious of what happens in the next two quarters and what lies beyond. Awesome. Um, Aranya, can you walk us through what you have been seeing in terms of you know service delivery uh, strategy as far as providers are concerned in the past couple of years and what they have been exploring in the past couple of years, especially post pandemic? Absolutely, Akshay. So everyone, now that we have an understanding about the macroeconomic environment as a whole, and we've also highlighted the, you know, the few issues that may arise out of it, it uh, is really important to understand where industry players or how they should approach these issues and how they should handle them. However, in order to do that, we have to first understand where the industry is right now. Right, so uh, in the next few slides, uh, I'll just be explaining overall um, how we see the industry being impacted by the macroeconomic environment. Okay, so if we uh, first analyze the regions which are being or have been used by firms in the last few years, right, so we see that they have been opting for the traditional regions of whether it be uh, APAC, whether it be EU. Um, however, what's important is that the risk associated with these regions has increased in uh, has increased recently, right? So be it the war between Russia and Ukraine, be it the severe heat waves, which actually also impacted the infrastructure in these regions. We are observing that the regions which have been used the most are uh, observing an you know, increment in their risk association. So it becomes very important for the firms operating from these regions to at least start to reevaluate their operations and see if any um, improvement or uh, a change is required or not. Uh, if we move to the next slide. Right, so within the regions now, observing if they're uh, operating from uh, established cities, which are also known as the, uh, the uh, are known as the tier one cities uh, or not, what we are observing is that at least the larger firms have openly embraced moving out of the tier one cities and are moving towards opening their offices in tier two or three cities. This is more apparent in the established global uh, services region. So again, you'll see this in APAC, you'll see this in um, EU. And um, again, it becomes very important for other firms which maybe have not started evaluating this right now to understand whether moving out of these established cities is a thing which will work with their strategy or not. Um, yeah, and it's a very important issue to evaluate. Uh, again, if we move to the next slide. In terms of the work now, which is happening, right? So as has been highlighted, there is a, a rise uh, of um, work from enterprises for high end IT work. Right, so again, uh, we have also observed that, that in the new centers which have been established, there's a lot more emphasis and investment being made uh, to uh, offer services which are more high-end, be it related to AI or any of the other, uh, any of the other high-end work. However, has, as everyone has already highlighted, because of the recession, there is this risk that work like this, uh, the, the requirement for this work might reduce. And again, if you see closely, these are the skill set where 
all the firms are um, or have issues related to wage inflation or or attrition so again it becomes very important to analyze how you should handle this area as a whole okay thank you for that arana i think uh, spectacular insights um, you know, really gives us information on how companies are approaching the location scenario right uh, now i think most of the insights which we covered in the last few pages they are also true of what the future holds uh, some of these changes are also what we expect more enterprises to undertake especially the uh, you know the four key changes uh, which to some extent we've talked earlier and we'll share more details uh, in the subsequent few minutes as well right now going forward we expect most of the organizations to increase the number of center setups uh, especially when it comes to tier 2 and 3 locations uh, the reasons for these is multiple uh, i think uh, companies want to be closer to where talent is tier 2 3 obviously provide cost advantage as well uh, further many companies are now still indefinite about what should be the long term hybrid working strategy uh, most companies are yet to finalize their long term plan so this is something which we expect to take more shape in 2023 a lot of this then feeds into, into what's the long term location strategy for your service delivery centers as well right so uh, again for most of the companies uh, and most of the attendees on this call if you believe yours is the only firm which has not taken a definitive stance you are not alone uh, more than 90% of the companies really haven't made long term plans for this right it's still in a you know, test as you go model now other than this uh, one more important factor which is emerging in considerations for most companies is how do you really adapt to the geopolitical and macroeconomic events some of these have the potential to completely disrupt the supply chain for services delivery so more proactive tracking and uh, building bcp related to some of these events as well is something which we are observing a lot of our clients do and something which they are taking quite seriously for the next few years and then the last point and especially as we talk more about hybrid or even so more about remote working we are actually seeing a rise in the gig workforce model now very few companies have actually involved gig workers to a substantial uh, extent Uh, but many of the companies have now started thinking about whether this can also be a potential source and a potential different type of a talent model which obviously can feed it into uh, various services right whether that's technology or business process services now with these overarching trends uh, we will now actually open up this question to the participants uh, on this webinar now most of these things are companies which are actually already trying for but are any of these levers uh what you are not wanting to explore as a part of your location strategy so again uh, i'll repeat myself are any of these levers not on your radar so essentially what we are trying to see is which of these are lower priority for you now for most of our clients uh you know they are taking decisions across multiple of these factors but Uh, there are limitations on the number of uh, you know things which you can bake in for your long term strategy so we'll give it more time uh, we'll give it 30 more seconds for you to fill in your responses and then what we'll quickly see is how has the group reacted at an overall level um, and you know we do expect that many of you would actually have been adopting or working on all of these uh, factors right okay results seem trickling in i see that we've crossed the 70% mark on the participants responding great okay as we as we end the poll i'll you know quickly uh, cover the results as we see uh, one of the elements which has come out as Uh, what's not a focus area for companies is the increased use of gig workforce now uh, generally what we see is the usage of gig workforce is less than 5% for most of the companies right now this is something which has crept up into the radar of senior execs just of late you know as we as talent has high preferences for remote working many of the talent uh, especially as you see north america and europe actually do not want full time jobs 
And that's where the demand for gig workforce actually arises from, right? It's largely being driven from how the talent actually perceives future work. So, but again, we do expect that something which is more long-term and not an immediate thing. Uh, as I said, you know, for most of the companies, this is 5% or even less than that, right? So not surprising that gig workforce is not a priority. Uh, the second uh, response which we got is none of the above, right? Which means that for most of the participants that are actually baking in all of these elements into their location strategy. And then I think very few companies are saying that they will not use tier two, three locations more. They will not plan for hybrid or proactively change the strategy with geopolitical risks, right? So I think results fairly in line with what we've expected. Uh, and even though we might see very few people saying that they will plan and strategize for gig workforce, do keep in mind, Yes, while this may not be true for the next couple of quarters, but when you take a three to five year view, this is something which is going to be an essential part of everybody's strategy. Great. With that, what we'll do is we'll move on to the uh, next section um, in which Rishi will talk more about the number of setups in tier two, three locations. Yes. So interestingly, this is the number one recommendation that we have. And if you recall the poll answer, this is the one where people where, where the audience felt that this is the gist, this is the most likely option that they are going to have. So kind of ties in with what we have here. So net, net, the first recommendation that we have is further increase the number of setups in tier two, three locations, which helps to drive margin expansion and improve talent supply chain. Okay, uh, what we have seen is the growth in tier two, three cities is a global phenomenon. We are witnessing this growth across geographies, be it onshore locations within US, Europe, as well as offshore locations, the likes of India, Philippines, and then even across both GBS and service providers, we have seen that both these segments continue to expand to tier two, three locations. However, the trend is more pronounced for service providers, uh, which includes both the global mailers or the India heritage providers. Now, there are multiple reasons for service providers to explore tier two, three cities as we see, uh, starting with cost savings. So any given day, a tier two, three location offers a 10 to 15, uh, 15 to 20 percent cost advantage over a tier one location. Uh, Talent, which is becoming an important criteria for location selection now. So the need to access untapped talent is driving a number of service providers to tier two, three locations. Uh, the desire to improve BCP diversify risk is another key factor. Further, uh, diversifying to tier two, three cities also helps improving the uh, employee value proposition uh, generally, companies have reported a lower attrition in tier two, three cities, uh, helps them build a differentiated value proposition for uh, and uh, gain an early mover advantage. Uh, also, in a number of cases, some of the tier two, three cities offer a better standard of giving given yes saturation. Wow. So, multiple reasons why uh, providers are looking at tier two, three cities pressure. Now, Rishi, when I, when I look at the slide, right? It seems the costs are low in tier two, three cities. There is more talent available. There is less competition. It's less risky. There's better standards of living. So any reason why they haven't been adopted at the scale uh, so far as compared to tier one cities? Yeah. So see, when we talk about the talent, there is an untapped talent potential. But if you consider the overall size of the talent, that's still higher in tier one cities. So from a centers uh, from a scale of center size perspective, it will still be lower or smaller in a tier two, three cities that you can target versus a tier one city. Okay, and, and just follow up question on that, right? So many of the attendees on this call, uh, on this webinar, uh, actually will already have centers in tier one cities. Now, uh, one of the questions which we receive from client is, is it a natural evolution that companies first start in tier one and then move to tier two, three? or can a client directly go into a new geography, new country, and straight on start with tier two, three centers, right? 
So in your experience, have you seen clients being bold enough to enter a new country and straight away ta uh, start with a major non-metro location? Mm, see, majority of the clients would start with a safer option, tier one option, and then move to a tier two, three city as they get more comfortable with the country. Uh, there would be very few examples where uh, some uh, where a client would have directly set up in a tier two, three cities. And again, this would be more in locations which are more prominent or in onshore locations, we have seen this phenomena uh, where directly setting up in a tier two, three cities. And of course, I think the trend will also change. I think a lot of this is based on historic data. Now that there is more hybrid remote working and more acceptance uh, of global service delivery, possibly this trend changes in the future as well. Okay. Great. Uh, with that, I think, you know, we've been talking about hybrid for a long time and uh, it's kind of overshadowing location decisions for multiple clients. I have clients calling me and complaining that they are not able to clearly articulate their location strategy because they don't know how many offices will they need. They don't know how many people will come to offices, right? So, uh, Akshay, uh, possibly you would like to walk us through some of the insights on how does hybrid fit into uh, the overall strategy for some of the companies and really how does it impact location choices as well? Sure, Prashant, and thank you. I think this has become a big question uh, recently for a client, right? Uh, they were exploring the capital city for a, in a particular country. Uh, and we have been discussing this with them for the past six months. Now what they started to discover is that they don't need to operate out of one location. They can target the entire region, the entire country, or even a sub-region, right? Um, and they are all going ahead with a complete hybrid model. So I think, according to us as well, now is the time when, and as you rightly mentioned, Prashad, right? We have been seeing some versions of hybrid. Everyone has, you know, showcased that okay, we want to go hybrid or we want to go remote. We feel now is the time when you need to become more definite. Uh, Pre-pandemic, the way the service delivery used to work was used to have hubs, which were large, multifunction. You had multiple thousand employees working there. Then you had a couple of smaller spokes, which were you know small to medium-sized centers, uh, limited functions, but operating in tandem. What we are seeing increasingly now, especially in the past six, eight months, uh, with the cost pressure, with the you know pressure to reduce your cap expenditure even and with it, all the challenges which are coming with retaining talent, right? With people having moved to a tier two, tier three location and you're struggling to find those people. Uh, we are increasingly seeing organizations leveraging more and more satellites. We are increasingly seeing organizations, you know, uh, having more hybrid or remote workers. Uh, now, different organizations, as you might see on the next page, have announced their different versions of their hybrid models. Right. In the sense, uh, they are saying that a set of workers will completely work remotely. A set of workers will partially dangle between office and uh, home. And a, a smaller set of workers will continue to work out of completely out of office. Right? I think <clears throat> what hybrid, uh, what organizations need to realize now is that hybrid is not only a way to, you know, reduce cost. It is a very strong talent attraction and retention level. I mean, if you start, uh, if you look at a Warsaw or a Buenos Aires or a Bangalore or Cape Town on the next slide, uh, the amount of talent you can capture uh, by having more hybrid, more remote workers increases multifold. What that means is you need not target only a single catchment area. And if you're open to the entire region or even the entire country in case of if, if, the, if the country is towards a smaller size, the amount of talent you can attract increases significantly. And that is, I think, a key driver or a key demand, uh, especially in the digital or niche skills. Just as a case example, uh, on the next slide, we have Philippines, right? So Philippines, uh, and if you were to see the amount of talent you can gather, if, if you consider a drive distance of 30 to 35 minutes, the amount of talent which you get is almost one third of the amount of talent you can gather if you were to start considering a driving distance of one hour, right? Come, uh, and this is all with respect to Manila. What this also means is uh, 
there's an opportunity for you to not set up newer centers, not have a, a higher capital expenditure. If you were to start having more of these hybrid remote kind of workers, which come to office once, twice every week. So A, you're making use of the same facilities, B, and, and you're reducing your operating uh, capital expenditure as well as operating cost. Uh, B, what you're doing is you're still able to attract and retain talent, which is again, uh, if you were to see our key issue survey this year as well, the number one priority for both enterprises and service providers. So I think uh, what we recommend to our clients today is that uh, lead with a strong message, uh, lead with a message on what you think your hybrid and remote strategy is and action on it going forward. Uh, I think uh, the next, uh, and. Now, I think uh, we, the other factor which we considered as part of our uh, the key things which uh, an organization needs to keep in mind is about proactively adapting to geopolitical and macroeconomic events. RNF, could you was, please walk us through what you are seeing on that? Side? Absolutely, Akshay. Um, so it's not a secret that we're now in a very uncertain world, right? So we have maybe issues related to climate change, we have issues related to inflation. Um, so it becomes really important for all the industry players to not just uh, proactively after the event has happened, analyze it, but it becomes very important for them to uh, essentially try to preempt things which may happen and try to at least uh, incorporate these things in their uh, strategy, right? So if we move to the next slide, again, we've, we've, we've spoken, we've seen uh, a lot of issues uh, in this year, um, um, right? And all of these have in a way impacted operations. Uh, if, we, if we just move to the next slide, Right, so here we just have an illustration, right? So uh, if we look at Ukraine, uh, before the whole uh, war with Russia, Ukraine was a very important region which was being used for engineering work and a lot of IT work as well, right? And the expenses were low and there was a lot of resource availability as well. And other regions, maybe like Spain or Ireland, which also had a lot of skill set, but maybe were not being used as much because of their higher expenses. But now, uh, after the war with Ukraine, a number of firms had to move out their work. They had to move out their workforce, their employees, which would have required a lot of expenses. So to avoid this uh, to happen again, it becomes really important, essentially, to try to preempt what regions in which you are operating are maybe operating in a high-risk zone and uh, proactively try to make uh, strategies of what if you are not able to operate from this region, where would you need to move your work or your work uh, or your employees? Uh, I think this aspect becomes really, really important. Great, uh, thank you for that, Aranya. I think wonderful insights we've had so far. We've you know we've touched upon both aspects of service delivery uh, location strategy at least, right? Which locations are preferred, and then what type of model is preferred, right? We'll come back now to gig workforce. Uh, again, this is a long-term trend which we are observing. Uh, we don't expect significant movement in the next two quarters. I think the reasons for that, which we had earlier discussed, also are pretty evident so far, right? So far the adoption of gig has been less than 5% by most of the companies. And in fact, it's some of the large tech service providers who are a bit ahead compared to GBS, uh, but the adoption has been quite low. Now, uh, many service providers have gone ahead and announced plans on how they would continue to develop uh, this workforce model. Of course, you know, how this fits into their normal traditional uh, solutions also is something which they still have to plan around, right? But generally, what we are observing is that there is increased experimentation, particularly as you see uh, programming, data science kind of uh, engagements. A lot of this is driven by two factors. Uh, first factor being, again, we, we discussed this earlier, 
some of the workforce does not want to do a, a full-time job, right? And they are perfectly fine doing gigs. And when we look at the uh, talent situation today in which demand has far outstripped supply, companies are actually even tapping some of these workers who just want to work part-time or for uh, a, a, a fixed lesser duration rather than a long-term duration, right? So few of these factors feeding into why gig is something which is slowly increasing. In fact, as we see on the next slide, uh, we are seeing uh, multiple of our clients report that across all geographies, uh, they, they are observing key segments where gig workforce is growing. When we ask the questions to clients on what are the areas where you are seeing more gig workforce uh, come up, most of the answers which we got was around digital work, right? So software engineering, uh, data sciences, some elements of design, UX, UI is where we are seeing most of the uh, implementation of gig workforce happening, right? So again, uh, food for thought for us to take away as we think about our long-term strategy. Uh, but again, you know, this is this is a trend which we keep observing and, and is growing slowly and steadily. I think with that, we have come to the end of the insights which we wanted to share. Um, and now to the uh, to the audience for this webinar, I just wanted to highlight that you do have complimentary access to some of our uh, thought leadership. Uh, we've kept two reports uh, which you can access complimentary. Uh, again, we've focused this more on location decisions uh, and changes, uh, just keeping in mind the theme of the webinar as well. Uh, to request complimentary access, please click the link in the chat, uh, which you would have just seen. Um, otherwise, you know, there's a there's a follow up email also which comes uh, after this webinar. You will receive uh, the link for this complimentary access uh, in that as well. Okay, uh, with that, uh, now we've heard wonderful insights from Akshay, Rishi, and Aranya. Now I'll actually. Uh, open up the analyst access for the people on the webinar as well. Uh, what we'll do is uh, we've received many questions. So maybe I'll just pick a few of them, uh, pose them to our uh, panelists. Uh, and then of course, if you have more questions, please keep sharing over chat. Uh, we'd be happy to have uh, any of our analysts address that as well. Okay, uh, I think many questions which we are seeing, let me just pick the Okay, one which is coming up again and again. Uh, possibly I've shared this question is for you. Uh, how has the geopolitical situation impacting location selection of services shift between the centers? So uh, I think what everybody would like to understand is how important is geopolitical risk when companies are thinking about their future strategy? Thank you, Prashna. I think this is a very relevant question in today's context. Um, uh, we have a life case example in front of us as well. Um, ever since the war broke out in Europe, we have seen organizations becoming more wary, of course, of the regions which are involved in the conflict. But we have seen hesitancy from organizations, even on the regions which are bordering the conflict, right? Because what uh, organization across are looking for is stability and they don't want to take risk. What we have been advising our clients uh, essentially is to be much more proactive, right? What that means is, for example, if you are talking about Europe, uh, maybe consider more of Western European locations like a Portugal, like a Spain, right? And uh, <clears throat> essentially avoid regions which are uh, currently in the middle of conflict. So because a geopolitical conflict does can also result in a loss of infrastructure, it can result in loss of life for your headcount, right? or for your employees, sorry for that. Um, and it is incredibly important for you to ensure that uh, the services delivery as well as the you know, assets, whether it's humans or infrastructure is always safe. Uh, whenever you are having operations in a single location. Okay. I mean, fair point. I think all risks have to be factored in. Uh, this is just one of the type of risks which has become more prominent, right? And of course, we are not even talking about some of the other risks as well. I think uh, from a climate change perspective as well, um, 
just um, yesterday, the day before, uh, we would have seen the situation in Bangalore, India as well, uh, you know, just flooding there. Uh, from a long-term climate change perspective, I think you know we do hear concerns, let's say, around Indonesia, Jakarta, especially where some of our clients have already started thinking about alternative sites as the city uh, effectively you know, uh, sinks a bit, right? So I think this is just one of the type of risks which has become even more prominent in today's world. But thank you so much for sharing the insights, Akshay. And, and Rashad, this is a very good segue into you know uh, things which you should consider when you are building your location strategy. So it is not only the traditional pillars around talent and cost. Of course, they are very important and one of the key drivers. But organizations need to take into account geopolitical, macroeconomic risk, climate change, as you rightly mentioned. Even you know when you're looking at a five, 10 year kind of down the road, uh, can take into account how the demographic pyramid of that location will change. Some of these are factors which are coming up. Again, yes, they're not as important as a talent or a cost right now, but they are things which you need to consider as you think about your location strategy. Yeah, I think with that question and the number of risks we covered, we've actually covered five or six questions which were asked in the uh, chat window. I think a lot of people asking about turbulent weather conditions, people asking about, uh, yes, they understand this, but this will lead to increase in cost. And then others saying that, of course, you know, I think uh, we will have to live with changes in cost as well, right? Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, the question is quite interesting, actually. I know we, okay. So with the advent of technology post-pandemic and work from home options available to both outsourced and in-sourced models, have we already not become location agnostic? Uh, quite an interesting question. Uh, Rishi, would you, would you want to take this up? I know it's a pretty interesting question, right? I mean, the entire webinar was focused on how should location strategy change? Uh, I think this is an existential question to the webinar itself. Does location strategy even matter? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Great question. What we see, see, what work from home is there, there are hard companies, very handful, which have 100% work from home. Most of them either, uh, either have a hybrid kind of a setup or are returning back to office. So in the long term, it's a hybrid now, whether that's a 50-50 versus a 70-30, that's a question that still needs to be answered. But in the hybrid is the way forward. And as such, uh, location will still be important. You need a base location. And then there are legal considerations around hiring just remote workforce in any country. So you need to have a base location, which can serve as an anchor for you to hire talent throughout the country. That's also something which uh, needs to be kept in mind. So the importance of having a location where some of the traditional figures of location selection around talent availability, cost, and operating in business, favorable operating in business environment it still remains important. Uh, you might add some additional dimensions to that in terms of how favorable are the remote working policies in that location. Uh, that's something which is increasingly uh, a number of clients are considering as they decide on their next location or how favorable is the remote working infrastructure, be it in terms of internet connectivity or home offices. Those are things which people are considering, but a location strategy still is the way forward. Uh, an interesting point. I'm just picking on one point which you mentioned, Rishi, which was government policies around hybrid, right? So. I see a question on chat from Kelly as well. Uh, I think this is largely around government policies, right? I think, especially if you see the two large geographies, India and Philippines, what have been the changes or the government's acceptance which you've seen of hybrid? Any challenges? We do see hearing concerns from companies that uh, the regulations are actually not very clear, right? But how much hybrid is allowed, whether it's allowed, Regulations are not being clearly broadcasted and shared. So your opinions on that, Rishi? Okay. So at the onset of COVID, most government, given lack of an option, they allowed hybrid or they allowed remote working. Uh, now, as the economy reopens and as the COVID restrictions are going away, gov governments are recalibrating what they stand on 
work from home is whether and the primary factor is whether to allow the some of the eco zone related incentives in a remote working environment so that's something which be it india be it philippines or some other locations uh, i see the government still deliberating and it's a short term arrangement which is provided as of now okay uh, so essentially rishi uh, summarizing i think you're saying none of the countries themselves have figured out long term as well so i think in the same boat as companies um, obviously countries regulations we typically tend to see act a bit slower compared to corporate side so yes they will yeah. take that time so far we've just been seeing extensions of allowing hybrid but very few of them have come out with uh, fixed regulations on what should be going forward right completely understand that in many locations especially in india and philippines there are location based incentives which companies uh, derive right so you know whether that's called scs pays up or by different uh, nomenclature in other locations you know employees which are tied to a location uh, companies do enjoy benefits uh, so far we've been seeing governments keep extending that waiver but yes completely right in saying that you know, we still have to see concrete policies from the government as well great uh, okay i think we'll have time for one more question uh, i do see an interesting question from clara uh, this is on do you see an increasing trend in leveraging nearshore versus offshore uh, that's part one of the question part two of the question says or is diversifying the delivery across multi sites happening to reduce geopolitical risk so essentially i think we know that multiple of these things are happening uh, what is your view on offshore versus nearshore and second how much are companies increasing this headcount in your existing sites versus branching out to newer sites right uh, akshay would you want to take this question sure prashna i think again that's a very interesting question and that's a question which we are getting on a daily basis uh the the root problem i think here is if you consider locations like india or even philippines uh, the kind of scale you can imagine in these locations is much higher than what you can traditionally get in a near shore location in let's say central east europe or that that being said uh we are still seeing growth in smaller setups within the central east europe uh, latam region again as a way to you know get or hire niche or digital scale right so companies are still favoring the traditional offshore locations they are still exploring those as far as large scale are concerned but still exploring ce latam or the near shore regions as you call them uh, to have more of you know more as a talent attraction the second part of this question uh, around diversifying risk and having multiple sites i think based on our conversations in the past one year uh, and this is something which we saw especially after pandemic right when entire countries even stopped working for a couple of days it was complete loss of service delivery now uh, the question is no longer i mean what we hear from our clients is it's no longer about you know diversifying let's say within the same country it is more about how diversified your overall portfolio is so yes that is uh, again a key driver as organizations think about their location strategy so they are trying to create that balance and this varies by organization right so for example some organizations are comfortable with let's say 50% of their workforce in a function being concentrated in one location some even fret at even looking at a 35% 30% concentration so while while it varies uh, from a company to company basis but still diversification is one thing we do still uh, see playing out in the next couple of quarters at least great uh, thank you so much for that akshay uh, with that we'll come towards the close of the qna session um i know uh, there were few questions more in the q and a chat which have been shared by others 
I would encourage uh, the individuals who still have some of these questions uh, unanswered to reach out to the account executives or the client relationship managers uh, which interact with your account. Uh, we'd be happy to answer some of these questions uh, you know, which were left pending on the chat one-on-one uh, -on -one with you as well, right? Before we move to the wrap up, um, we'll just focus on uh, one of the type of offerings uh, from Everest Group. So while Everest Group provides a variety of advisory and research support across the entire gamut of global sourcing uh, and services strategy, we'll just focus on one, which is location decisions, uh, just keeping in mind the overall theme of today's discussion. So we do help clients assessing locations, conducting due diligence, uh, looking at the overall location portfolio and optimizing it, making it more future ready and apt for growth strategy, right? So whether this is adding new locations, assessing which current locations can be optimized further, and how can you make your delivery portfolio more future-proof? Uh, that is uh, something which we closely work with a lot of our leading clients on. Uh, of course, BCP uh, risk mitigation has become much more important in some of these discussions as well. So in case you do have some of these needs, uh, again, uh, you know the Everest Group contacts to reach out to. Uh, please do get in touch with them. Uh, otherwise, for the uh, analysts on this call, uh, on this webinar as well, uh, we will share our email IDs and contact details at the end, and you can get in touch with the analysts on this webinar as well. Now, today's webinar, we focused on a special topic, a topic which we felt was of burning importance across most of our clients. But if you do go to our research repository, you would see blogs, much more complementary material and insights. Uh, you will see many reports which you can access as well. And this is something which we encourage all of the attendees uh, to see uh, as well, right? Uh, after this webinar, you will get a copy of this webinar and you'll receive the link for some of this additional content as well. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, the analysts on the call today, uh, Akshay, Rishi, Aranya, uh, thank you so much for the time today. Uh, it was great hearing insights from you. Uh, I always find it very insightful talking to you. Uh, especially because you, what you share is not just based on Everest Group uh, assessment, insights, and tracking, but it is also a, a mix of whatever you hear from clients as well, right? So between the three of you, I know you talk to yeah. dozens of clients each month. So the kind of insights which we saw in today's webinar that was synthesized across what most of the leading companies worldwide are thinking about, right? So thank you for this. Very insightful, very relevant. And uh, thank you to all the attendees as well for attending this.